Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 619. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 18th, 2020. Yeah, it's an interesting thing when you're a full-time RVer and you go to your home and you're like, do I sleep overnight in my home? Do I take everything out of the RV and move into the home for the weekend? You're like, ah, no, no, no. So we're sleeping in the RV at a Cracker Barrel about three blocks from home and we're just doing our laundry at home and getting the mail that uh, our neighbors have been collecting for us. So we're well, out of here. We're going south. Part- Though that's smart, Kevin, because if you actually sleep in your home in Connecticut, don't you start triggering a tax clock and I'm you have sure to start paying oh Connecticut God. state income tax? It's it. We've been gone now for 75 days. And I get there, we have a person collecting the mail, and I have a, a person who does the, my business servers and stuff like that. But I get there, and there's some notes on the door. The Census Bureau wants me to answer where I am. Well, I've been in every state in 50 days, but uh, so I have to do the census I uh, forgot to do. These, the gas company, uh, when I left, I turned the gas off and I turned the water off. So if there's a, a burst pipe or something like that, I'm not flooding out my neighbors. And both the, the uh, water company and the gas company have notes on my door saying, uh, we can't read your meter. I turned off the whole electric system too. Uh, we're going to send the sheriff out if we can't, you know, we, you turn your system back on. So apparently you can't turn everything off when you leave for a little while. So I, well, I have don't to, you have to keep something on for the winter so the pipes oh, don't yeah, burn? No, no right, it's winter time. I, we're, we're prepping the condo for winter, so I'll keep the uh, furnace at 55 degrees. And I have to keep the water on so the pipes don't freeze and stuff like that. So uh, I turned all systems back on because, George, we came back. Like typical, typical college students, we're just doing the wash, and then we're out of here. We're going, <laughs> we're going to Delaware uh, the end of the, the end of Sunday after church. I'm also attending church for the first time in 75 days uh, in person. So be fun. How are you doing, George? Just fine. Uh, we're starting the. We're having the discussions about uh, how it, our reopening takes place. We're following what I call the California plan where the California, you have to have below 5% new positive infection rates for seven average seven days Mm -hmm. before a county can reopen facilities. And our infection rate is running pretty high in Citrus County. It's been about, it's been up to 15% at some points, but it's about seven or 8%. As soon as we drop below the 5%, we start a 21 day clock and then we're reopened for business at reduced capacity. And so when you have a committee, uh, we have arguments of, well, do we use folding chairs or do we space our chairs? Do we just put big no seating here chairs, uh, sure. tape and all these fun things. And so I have been filled with angst and anxiety. It's like, I feel like a Broadway producer. Is anybody going to come to my show? Uh, not that's reopening. Uh, well, I so heard the reviews are good. You're getting good reviews. So, you know, online uh, people I, like your sermons. You're 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 one of the more popular uh, Episcopal priests. So, the reviews are, yeah, are but, good. But you know, I haven't been able to re-sign the the tap dancing penguin yeah, act right. or some of the other <laughs> things that keep people coming. Um, so. It, because I've been physically inactive uh, for two weeks now because of all the uh, minor surgeries, uh, toe surgery, three skin cancer surgeries, I'm covered with, with uh, I can't move my body rapidly in any one direction or I'll tear a stitch. God made me to be a peasant. You know, God made me to have a shovel and to dig potatoes and be physically happy and active. Well, when I'm physically inactive, my brain goes bananas and I worry. Mm-hmm. And so I'm in that physical inactivity worry period. Yeah. Uh, I don't think your situation is unique. When I, I have lots of Facebook. There are a lot of potato pickers in the Episcopal Oh my gosh, sorry. I have a lot of Facebook friends who have to be clergy. 
and you can hear the angst in this is an ending is it this is going to be with us for not five months which my my priest was like that <laughs> by summer we'll all be back in church or uh, you know our bishops like yeah if this goes a year it's it's not a yeah you know, we'll be back in in and going again it's starting to click in that this is it this may be uh for the foreseeable five maybe ten years how we operate wearing mask uh how are we operate in public my wife and i we're not i don't want to say this we're not walmart shoppers but we're walmart shoppers you 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 travel around in an rv and that's about the biggest parking lot you can find you go in and you, you do your shopping at walmart we're in there wearing mask and we've shopped with each other together for 30 years huh what i can't hear you and because she's talking through the mask i'm talking through the mask we have no communication skills whatsoever in a walmart in the same aisle next to each other and it becomes a very frustrating experience and then i go to ask a customer service person a question where's the white socks it sounds like a peanuts character or a teacher from peanuts and it's a whole anxiety I, I i've never been anxious going shopping george i know i don't want to go to walmart anymore i don't want to go shopping i want to go to texas roadhouse but it's so different now there's anxiety at the clergy level there's anxiety at the lay level there's just the this world is anxious over covid and we're having trouble dealing with this is the normal now no longer new normal normal well you sound like you've got a good bishop because he's basically telling you and talking to you that well this will be a year this will be so whatnot there are a lot of us who have bishops who live far away and who collect their monthly taxes who we hear nothing from i'm sure they say something in the monthly newspaper but i don't read it so uh, <laughs> but the uh but there really is a sense, at least for me, of being on my own. And I know a number of my clergy friends across the country have that sense of the the hierarchy, the leadership, is this has not been their finest hour. No. There are exceptions, and we've heard about them, and we've spoken about them on this show. But the leadership is not looking too good right now. No, and I don't know if it's a time thing. I, I would have thought the church as a whole could have reacted better faster and been more at the forefront of what we do about COVID. And what I find is the church is pretty unprepared for this uh, at every level. Now I'm, we're currently in Connecticut East coast. We have Bridgeport. We have many cities where high unemployment rate. Once this uh, executive order from Trump expires where you can't evict people, there's going to be evictions all over in Connecticut, all over on the East Coast and, and around the nation. And that's going to create a lot of homeless people. Church, are you ready for that? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think the church is ready uh, for the people who are homeless, who don't have food, who don't have a place to stay, uh, who've been evicted. I don't think the police departments are ready to evict that many people. Uh, the, the local sheriff isn't going to spend, you know, hire another hundred sheriffs to help evict half of Bridgeport. So it's, like we said, uncertain times and uh, just this anxiety inside the church and outside the church, George. Thankfully, God's not anxious in this. And uh, um, if you do believe your theology right, he is in control of this. And so george we need to move on to some other news besides covid and i hate to bring this up but we talked last week about uh, the church of england and we talked about the uh gafcon uk we got a little bit more news this week from uh sources inside gafcon uk what's the latest george well we've had two public documents the house of bishops of the church of england met on the uh, i think it was tuesday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and they released their uh, summary of bu business, and it was a little more descriptive than past notes. And they talked about uh, 
basically, if you decode the language, they talked about, we recognize we're in trouble, but we think the way out is diversity and inclusion. And so we're gonna dig the, we're, we're gonna keep digging even though the roof and the sides are falling upon us, we're still going to go down in the hole. They're not going to address the uh, systemic or fundamental problems of the Church of England. They're going to basically continue doing the, uh, the pet projects, the vanity projects of the leadership. So that's not, so basically we're, going to, we're not going to see any change from the Church of England. It's going to continue to decline. And I believe this COVID virus is going to speed up that decline. Uh, GAFCON UK released an email to its supporters in the UK where it said our council of reference, our group leaders have gotten together and talked and was a good meeting. And then I don't know whether this was written badly or whether it's a true statement. So you help me decode this. The statement said, we, we looked at our long-term financial viability, whether or not we're going to make it financially. Now, in the United States, when you have some sort of statement like that, you then immediately have a second clause where you give, well, here's how we're going to address this. Sure. Here's the good news. We have a plan. We have a plan. We bought a lot of scratch-off lottery tickets, and this afternoon we're going to be seeing if we won the multi-lotto jackpot. There was nothing like that in the GAFCON UK letter. And so people who are members of GAFCON UK forwarded, I had a number of them forwarded to me, and they said, oh, my God, this it, the ship's been holed under the water. Here is the public statement that they're not going to be able to make it financially. It's just not working. So I wrote to GAFCON UK, and it's been a week no, not a week, four or five days. Mm -hmm. No response asking them, could they please explain this public statement? It's not a good sign. Now, people may be on vacation, but well, the, what we're saying, I guess where I'm coming from this is the big picture, the, the, the strategy of, if you will, the bulk of conservatives in the Church of England is reform from within. Mm -hmm stay if we fight if we rally around the good evangelical and anglo-catholic bishops we can hold the line in the church of england yeah we'll still have the few crazy people on the margins but we'll be able to carry on and proclaim the good news of jesus christ that strategy has not worked justin welby has appointed a great many liberal bishops a great number of women bishops a partnered lesbian bishop no conservative evangelical bishops have been appointed under Welby's tenure. These mega churches, uh, well, let's say Holy Trinity Brompton, Nicky Gumbel is in his mid 60s. He's going to retire in a few years. HTB has basically been the one, one of the few bright spots in the Church of England scene. They're going to have a new man at the helm there, or woman conceivably. Is HTB going to? Is the magic going to die with Nicky Gumbel's departure? Is the successor going to basically accommodate? Let's say they pick the guy who runs the HTB plant in Brighton. That's one has been very, very gay friendly, uh, you know, supporting pride parades. What if, and right now, Alpha is conservative on human sexuality. They don't push that. They won't make a stink about it. But what happens if they go over the edge too? What will happen to the alpha movement? Will that die? What happens to these mega churches uh, that are basically institutional fortresses? Their clergy are all in their 60s and they've got to have new clergy come in who need to have a license from the bishop. What if we have the American plan? You remember uh, in the Diocese of Washington, 20 odd years ago, this all started when Jean, Jane Dix Gene Jane Dixon, yeah, Jane. <laughs> Jane. Jane Dixon refused to license uh, a, a conservative Anglo-Catholic in Akakik, uh, Maryland. Mm -hmm. He was brought into the church, an Anglo-Catholic stalwart, Ford and faith leader, and she refused to give him a license. And that precipitated the collapse. Or the, you know, one, that was one of the early collapses Sparks. in the Episcopal yeah. Church. Mm -hmm. 
let's say St. Uh, Helen's Bishopgate in London. Uh, Sarah Mullally decides to insist that somebody who recognizes her uh, Episcopal orders, who's totally on the team, yeah, they're allowed to keep their particular private views on human se human sexuality and you know penal substitutionary atonement, so long as they play the game. Would St. Helen's Bishopsgate be the same church if you have a compromised leader? Now, I'm not saying that's happened. No. But, but what I'm things... saying is that the structural pieces are in place for things to get worse rather than better. And on the flip side, AMIE has basically decided to be a little independent sect. Andy Lines has no in uh, Bishop Andy Lines has no internet presence. Uh, he has no pastoral presence. It's a secret society for all intents and purposes. Um, the Gafcon UK doesn't have any money. It doesn't have a collection of retired or semi-active Church of England bishops to give it some vigor. No Duncans or Ikers or Schofields or Ackermans, you know. There's no leadership there who can basically lead the fight. So what is my equivalent in the Church of England to do? Somebody from their mid-40s to late 50s who, uh, we don't admit it that loud, but yeah, I got so many X years before I'm fully vested in my pension. Uh, I need to be able to support my wife and children when I retire. So I got to stay with the system. I want the Volvo. I need the Volvo. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, not to be silly, Kevin, but yeah. you know, you, I, this I'm is your life. To, yeah. And and what we're seeing is that uh, there's a lot of great talk from lay leaders about, uh, yes, we'll be able to support you and protect you if you're clergy. And then you look around and you see that that just doesn't happen. No. So it's, there's the whole pressure to pull your horns in, pull your head in, just watch the clock mark the calendar as the days come and just pray god does some sort of miracle it's just an absence of leadership i believe you and i were at gafcon too when peter jensen said listen we're gonna we're going to the shores of england we're gonna uh, take gafcon into england and we were that was an interesting story because we know that england and the church of england will be very hard ground if you want to use a parable um, they're, they have a different way, different, they think different politically, they think different, uh, strategically, they think it's a different thought process. Here in America, we have frontierism, we have, uh, a bit more entrepreneurial spirit where you can take an ACNA and make it successful where you have pro-women's, uh, orders people and anti-women's orders people working together. At the end of the day the bishops on both sides of this uh, issue in the ACNA don't hate each other and are not working against each other. In the Church of England, you and you brought up some good examples where, you know, it's just there's no working together, there's no game plan, and there's no long-term vision for uh, GAFCON UK or the Church of England itself. If the Church of England is going to die, certainly uh, the sects around it are going to die as well. Um, they're just two people, too many people set in their ways, set in their mindset of how they operate. Uh, where the ACNA was able to get away with uh, the collapse uh, of the conservatives in the Episcopal Church, I can't see how GAFCON UK is going to get away with the collapse of the, uh, the conservatives in the Church of England. I think they just, they'll go Roman Catholic, they'll go Orthodox, or they'll just remain in their small parishes and not say a word and there seems to be well, this they'll become independence you know, they'll okay. become independence but just think of this clampdown has any conservative bishop i don't know if there's any left in the church of england tweeted anything in the last five years no i mean there's just no communication no uh online presence as, as we talk about um it, it's a different mindset and i think the church of england and for now uh, gafcon uk or amie as it is isn't going to make it uh we got the warning 
and the warning is made louder by lack of responses from uh, our, our questions to it. So there's also this is chauvinistic on my part, but there's a difference in worldview. Kevin, you touched on this. There's the frontiersman worldview. I'm an Episcopal priest. I'm quite happy with my parish life. I can put up with my diocesan life. I'm unhappy with the national church life. But in many respects, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a religious entrepreneur. I'm a frontiersman. I don't have my sense of valuation. I don't have my sense of self-worth validated by an institution uh, to, that, to the extent that someone who's an institutionalist does. I don't see that, no. I call Melvin Tinker has more of an American mindset than an English mindset, sure. so this is not universal. <laughs> no, it's not. In, in, and I hope he doesn't find that insulting. Uh, but there's there's a, there are massive cultural uh, differences. Another major difference is that for me, win-win is a virtue, mm -hmm. in the sense that if I can find a settlement or a system where I can thrive and my neighbor who I may think is completely loony tune and has got it completely wrong and it, they're sacrificing virgins to Woten and stuff like that, and they're going to hell. But if I can find a way that I can win and he can win, then we can continue going forward. And I hate, I know I'm going That's to sound Donald Trump. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also Frank Griswold. It's, it's Frank Griswold. We forget it's the, uh, the deal. Yeah. That Frank, under Frank Griswold, during the decade of evangelism, and in the first part, let the ninety in the nineties, it was brown. The Episcopal Church grew. Mm -hmm. It grew, and it grew even though we had Jack Spong and Jack Eicher. Uh and then we moved into the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey years, which was my way or the highway you know you either agree with what i say or i destroy you the the idea of win-win of sort of a sense of uh, modesty that i am right in all things was totally uh, lost and you have these ideologues um to leading and I don't know how we can have such a, how, where the culture can snap back easily from uh, the damage done by the ideologues. I, I, having once been a proud Episcopalian, uh, I hear the words that you speak, you know, that uh, I'm able to be functional, very well functional as a parish priest in my little parish in, in uh, Central Florida, because nobody bothers me. I don't bother anybody. We are worshiping and serving the Lord right here in Lacanto, Florida. I, I get that. Um, and I don't get my identity from the larger organization. And in the same respect, I watch an ACNA grow. Okay, we're at a cracker barrel, and I bet that's the dump truck or the, the, the garbage truck taking out the, the cardboard boxes where they put all their food. So, um, the ACNA was not allowed to, or the conservatives were not allowed to exist within the Episcopal Church anymore. 770 people were defrocked. And uh, the ACNA was a wonderful spark that happened in response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I always agree that there should always be an art of the deal. Can we negotiate a settlement? But then I look long term as a church historian or a lover of history, and I remember where there was an agreement that we will have mutual flourishing. I know you guys don't like what we're doing here, but we're going to have mutual flourishing. We will make sure you flourish and you make sure we flourish. And over time, that mutual respect, that mutual working together dies. It's not dying in the ACNA, but it died in the Church of England. Yeah. And well, it's also died in the American political uh, body politic. Oh, my God. Great um, example. So oh. this, is not, this is not entirely a, a religious problem. It's a cultural societal problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hate to be pessimistic, but it will get worse before it gets better. 
and perhaps the all the noise coming from the election that's going on uh, makes things seem even more dire and dark. But uh, you know, God's church will continue. Uh, Jesus Christ is today is the same today, tomorrow, yesterday, and November third. <laughs> yes, and so we. I don't want to leave it away doom and gloom, but if we put our faith or trust in men and in their institutions, of course we're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it's having spent my early year childhood in Philadelphia and having to root for the Eagles and the Phillies, I knew what disappointment was. And I put not my faith in the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, so that, you, I'm being silly, but... Uh, for those who are purists and who have all the answers already laid out, I sound like I'm waffling and weak. But, you know, part of my job is to lead people in a broken, sinful, fallen world and find a way to go around evil. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not able, on my own, by myself, to overcome evil. I need Christ to do that. Which, a test like covid is here to draw you closer to the Father and to provide you as a witness a salt and light to the world which is anxious in this time. And we as Christians need to, to be able to address this anxiousness, reach out to this anxiousness, live into this anxiousness, um, and let light and salt shine out from us. And I I believe the way I look at life, the most important thing for me, our little Christian education class for 12 year olds is the most important thing I can do. Uh, the bringing to a mature understanding of Jesus Christ for a 12 year old, for little old lady in a Bible class that meets on two Wednesday afternoons. This is the true work of the church. It's not committees, it's not papers. It's not academic theses. It's building disciples one by one by one. And that is where we're going to win and overcome the darkness. And when we when we get so worked up of playing the enemy's games on the enemy's terms, of course we're going to be discouraged when we get defeated again and again. But if we do the work of Christ and have our focus on Christ, you know, Jesus Christ did not set out to be king or emperor or the high priest or any of the institutional prerequisites of his time and day. He set out to bring and build the kingdom one person at a time through his disciples. By meeting the women at the well, not by have, meeting at a Jerusalem council. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not and it's not just the clergy's job to do this, it's every believer's job. Mm -hmm. And so long as we're engaged in that, the world can go its own little way, but Christ's kingdom will continue to grow and be strong. And on that note Here endeth the lesson, I'll get off my book. <laughs> no, no, you did good. You did really good. This is why you have great reviews, George. You 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 know the message, you can deliver the message. And the message resides within you. That's the awesome part. Okay, we're going to draw this long unscripted to a conclusion. I'm going from Connecticut. My wife and I are driving down to the shores of Delaware. We're headed slowly to uh, Lacanto. Stop by Wilmington and say hello to this senior citizen uh, I know. Uh, oh, sure. Well, we don't do a lot of visiting people in COVID. I, the last thing I want to Well, he doesn't do come out of his basement <laughs> either. But okay. if you see Joe, wave yeah. hello. You know, people have been emailing me, Kevin, can we get together? La, la, la. I don't want to be the person you met that you go home and die of COVID. You know, I just, I, I, it doesn't doesn't really relate well to the, the future of Anglican Unscripted. So we do see people periodically. If we met before, I may have uh, coffee with you. We're heading down through Delaware. I hope to be in Lacanto because I'm house-sitting for George when you go back over to some island somewhere where you were famous for a wedding you did what what's the the place you were at like uh saint bart's in the uh, west indies going back for uh, four weeks uh uh end of november first week of december to saint bart's in the caribbean yeah, i'll be i'll be house sitting your cats and that's that's the kind of friendship george and i have he goes to this island doesn't invite me but i do get to take care of his cats that's cool that's no big deal i'm kevin Carlson. <laughs> And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 619 of Anglican 
unscripted.